we're looking at the scars of previous cataclysmic events. The catastrophic flooding caused by the Younger Dryas impact triggered mass global devastation. Humanity suffered a critical blow. Atlantis, ancient Egyptians, the story of Noah, the Epic of Gilgamesh, all spoke of cataclysmic floods brought on by the gods. No one knows for sure where Atlantis is or if Atlantis exists, but the search is ongoing. That's why I'm traveling the country with Randall Carlson to unlock some of the mysteries from the Great Flood. Are we looking at history altering landscapes induced by an asteroid impact? Could the story of humanity be much different than we once thought it was? We're searching for the clues that may lead us to the official discovery of Atlantis. But before scouring the ocean floor, there are some remarkable formations that very few people are aware of. The Channeled Scablands, one of the most fascinating landscapes on the planet and one of the first clues that illuminate the ancient mystery of Atlantis. Thanks to the work of Randall Carlson, we are remembering the ancient story of our past. We are reconnecting the dots. We are discovering the shocking details of the Younger Dryas climate catastrophe. We got to spend five days in the field learning directly from Randall Carlson. What you're about to see is live footage from that event. Because I got into this Atlantis thing. I, I wanted to say, is there anything, is this bullshit or is there, you know, is there actually something to this? So I read about four or five different books on Atlantis. So the other one that I read was a book by Otto Mook, a German physicist who theorized that Atlantis was, and he picked up on, on the ideas of, of Ignatius Donnelly, who wrote Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, in, I think, 19, had it published in like 1883. So he was the one who originally proposed that there was a, a, a cometary-induced catastrophe that, you know, did all this stuff, megafaunal losses, created these huge gravel. See, that was when his later book, The Age of Fire and Gravel, and as you're going to see this week, there are these enormous deposits of gravel and boulders all intermixed. Well, that's the result of these tremendously violent forces, these torrents of water just tearing across the landscape and ripping up hundreds of feet of bedrock, literally within a matter of hours or days, right? Now, we're going to see that when we go up into Grand Coulee, we're going to see a gash that was, I'm, if I had to guess, I'm going to speculate one to three weeks of water flow. I'm, I'm extrapolating that from thinking back to how much ice would have been up here available. And if you, if you melted this ice, a lot of it is going to flow to the west, off into, right directly into the Pacific Ocean. And a lot of those fjords on the west coast of British Columbia, I believe, were basically like drowned Grand Coulees, if you want to put it that way, right? And as we go through the week, we'll be seeing stuff, and I'll be pointing out specific things that I think if, if this uh, relates directly to this reinterpretation. Where we're standing is pretty fascinating, actually, because Randall just told us this used to be under about six to 700 feet of water. This gap that we're standing in was a flood that took place in just three to four days. I don't know, Randall, the more I look at this, I'm just not too convinced that a flood came through here. It sounds a little bit like a conspiracy theory, I, if you ask I, me. Well, I, I was going to not, you know, go there, but since you've, you've, you've found me out, <laughs> it's all just made up. Yeah, this is, this just isn't very convincing. No. You kind of look the top of the Twin Sisters, if you extend that across. That, I believe, was the pre-flood sill profile. In other words, that was the elevation. When the floods came through, they ripped everything out from the top of the Twin Sisters over to the other side. Wow. And sculpted down to the level that it is now. So you were saying this all took place in just three to four days? Right here, yeah, because you can figure that it was pouring through here at about nine cubic miles an hour. About 350 million cubic feet per second. It would have been a massive, dynamically seething turbulent body of water right. loaded with sediment, thousands of icebergs floating in it. And you probably had iceberg jamming here in the gap. Right. Because so much is trying to get through the gap, what happens is it creates the backwater effect. Mm -hmm. So it tries to jam in, the water has to rise 
and as the water rises, it creates more pressure, which eventually pushes the, uh, the, the blockade down until the next blockade, the next iceberg jam happens, the water rises again. And when we go to see Burlingame Canyon after this, I think that that's the explanation for what we're going to see there. Mm. The backwater effect, not, not separate floods, se you know, each one being a separate ice dam, a separate Lake Missoula over in western Montana, but maybe one or two fillings of yeah. Pasco Basin. We set off on a journey across the channeled scablands to explore a powerful clue that illuminates the details of the Younger Dryas climate catastrophe. Thanks to a freak accident in the 1930s, this formation was uncovered completely by chance. So it kind of feels like we're out in the middle of like a farm in the middle of nowhere. I don't know what to expect. What are we gonna see? <laughs> I have no idea, but apparently uh, this is very rare. We're going to see something that is on somebody's private land. Not many groups have been able to see it, so I guess we're in for a treat, but I'm gonna be honest, it looks like we're in the middle of Idaho right now. <laughs> That's pretty incredible. So these are fields for, you know, as far as the eye can see. And apparently this pipe burst in the 1930s and exposed this massive canyon. But what's really special about this is it exposes all the different layers of sediment that are underneath all of these hills. The sediment helps us understand a little bit more about the flood. And as you can see all the different layers of substrata, we're able to kind of pick this apart and study it on a deeper level. What's pretty much assumed is each, each of these layers mm -hmm. represents a separate flood that tried to go through Wallula Gap. Oh. But each of the floods was a filling of Lake Missoula. And each filling of Lake Missoula required a separate ice dam. And in that model, you gotta go, how long does it take for Lake Missoula, Missoula to fill? The estimates are 30 to 100 years for 600 cubic miles of water to accumulate. Then it bursts through the ice dam. <clears throat> all that water gushes down, all coming down here to Wallula Gap. Can't get through Wallula Gap, so the backwater effect means that it comes up, the water drains out, and it leaves a layer of mud. Okay, so now the question is, if each layer is a, a separate flood, that means 30 to 100 years separates each layer. I don't think that's right. I think, that all of this was laid down in a matter of weeks. I think it was a process more like that that we've got going on here, rather so than- So this was a quick process then? Yes. While the ice was going through it? That's what I would, that's what I'm arguing and that's what I'm putting in my paper. Randall's backwash theory is now causing us to completely rethink the epic scale of these floods. Mainstream geologists agree these floods were massive, but this discovery has a few pieces of evidence that these floods were much more massive than mainstream archaeologists and geologists once thought. You think these are fracture fills? Those are dikes. Yeah. Those are called so. And here, that's another piece of evidence because, see, it cracks and it has to fill vertically. Yes. And and see, yeah. here's the thing: if this is if this whole column is drying out in mass, that's when you get right. those dikes. Also, yeah. Here it is right now, 15 inches of rainfall, but you see, you've already got trees growing, right? right? Yeah. If 30 years, 50 years went by on a layer, there'd be plenty of vegetation. Now, remember, this is a very low energy deposition environment. In other words, the water's moving in slowly, right around here, it's stopping and then flowing back out and leaving this layer of mud. So it's not erosive, see? Whatever is here is gonna get it's just like if we dumped a bunch of mud in here, the remains of those trees are going to get buried in the mud. Yeah. And if you come in and you dig up and you do core samples, you're going to find remnants of those trees. Right. You don't find anything like that here. The almost instant release of billions of tons of glacial water poured into the Atlantic and Pacific oceans, causing a rapid rise in sea level. Enough of a rise to instantly sink an island 
or destroy a city like Atlantis. In order to truly find the origins of humanity, we're going to have to look at evidence all over the world. And beyond our own world, we'll have to look at evidence from other planets. But what would that imply? That's the, that's the interesting question. What would that imply if there was a catastrophic melting of the Cordilleran ice sheet? And in fact, up here at the mouth of the Mackenzie River that was under the ice sheet, there's a whole complex of scab lands and catastrophic flood erosional features that have essentially created the valley of the Mackenzie River. So you had catastrophic flows actually into the Arctic. Now, were they happening at the same time? I don't know, at this point the dating is not accurate enough to say that or there's not enough data. There's still a whole lot of work left to do on dis to decipher this whole phenomenon. But I think that we can, at this point, there's some, I think some, some fairly robust speculation that can be made. And one of these is that there was a multi-impact event and mankind was probably given a glimpse of such an event back in 1994 when the 21 pieces of fragment and comet shoemaker Levy 9 plunged into Jupiter. Astronomers have witnessed five massive explosions on the planet Jupiter as fragments from the shoemaker Levy collided with the planet. Larger explosions are expected later this week. They called it the biggest explosion in the solar system for hundreds of years. Half an hour after the first comet fragment went in, the impact was still visible. And I think for the, you know, for the sake of their sympathy for the, for the poor pathetic human race, the gods said, well, we'll do it on Jupiter this time rather than the Earth. Because if we do that on the Earth, there won't be any of them left. So we'll do it on Jupiter and maybe, maybe they will witness this and put two and two together. So far that hasn't happened except in very limited circles, but I think that that is the likely explanation. And I think I can now point to at least 10 of the impact epicenters. 